Good afternoon, Winslow. Elaine and I are just delighted to be here in Palo Alto to uh, talk to you um, and get some um, input from you about your scientific uh, past and uh, a little bit about your uh, career. Well, it's a pleasure to see a former colleague from Annual Reviews and a present colleague from Annual Reviews and a former graduate student. I'm afraid the former graduate student knows a little bit more about me than uh, then well, I never do. mind. Right. <laughs> I know what questions it's a, not to ask. But it's a pleasure to, pleasure to yeah. be here. I, I wanted to start by um, asking you whether when you, when you started your research uh, career, I guess I, maybe 50, 60 years ago. I beg your you, pardon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Had you imagined that there might be so many photoreceptors? When I started my career, I had mm. absolutely no interest in photoreceptors and didn't know anything about them. I knew that uh, light caused uh, oxygen to move around, or it was supposed to, according to one investigator, but no interest in that. Oxygen, yeah, that was great. I wanted to learn about uh, plant growth hormones, but uh, light didn't come in until uh, a little later on. But at that point, when light did come in, and you started to think about photoreceptors, <coughs> were we thinking about one receptor or well, multiple well, receptors, this, you know, this, and how did it evolve? This was actually in, in, in 1957, when a student in mm -hmm. a class I was giving put his hand up in the back of the room and said, uh, uh, now why hasn't somebody done that, this experiment? And he described the experiment. And he said, well, it seems to me that would resolve the controversy about uh, what the growth hormone is doing. And I said, gee, nobody's done that. We can do that. And, and I had a senior who wanted a project, so I gave it to him and good heavens, it worked. And we solved the problem. At, and that was the start, because at that point I thought, I've got to know what molecule it is that's picking up that light mm -hmm. signal. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it was just the blue light receptor. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't mm -hmm. that there were, as we now know, there are lots of them, but uh, at that point, everybody assumed that there was one. But and that wasn't the first receptor that, the blue light receptor wasn't the first one that was identified? Or? No, no, it was a red, a red light mm -hmm. receptor that was right. identified in 1959, uh, Warren Butler and Bill Siegelman mm -hmm. and some very brilliant people, Sterling Hendricks uh, at Beltsville. Probably one of the greatest achievements by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's uh, research labs there. Uh, and, and it actually kept you busy for a while. Yes, <laughs> and you did a sabbatical with them, didn't I you? I did a sabbatical mm -hmm. with them, that's right. And I, had, I wrote a review on the growth response to light, blue light coming in from one side. And I hadn't finished it. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Eventually, I did finish it during the first month on that sabbatical, and Sterling Hendricks kept complaining that uh, I wasn't in the lab, and I was supposed to be in the lab. <laughs> and uh, so I finally finished it, and I thought, well, he, you know, I better give it to this intellectual giant to read. And you know, he took it, and he hadn't, didn't see him for about a week, and then he came back and said, Ma, you're wordy. <laughs> 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 but then he, the next day he apologized. He said, I suppose people are going to work their way through all these intricate little details and try to figure it all out. Uh, so anyhow, so, so that was my mm -hmm. first uh, experience with those guys and with, uh, they had just isolated the red far red reversible pigment that they eventually named phytochrome. Mm -hmm. So I was in, able to get right in on some of the early attempts to purify it. So that got me interested in, in another photoreceptor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that worked out very well. So then you spent some time working on phytochrome and phytochrome yeah. signaling and eventually got into the molecular biology and... Um, well, because uh, of people like, like Elaine, yes. And she came with the chemistry, chemistry measure from Oberlin, as I recall, yes. and didn't, didn't claim to be a plant biologist. Well, I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, but you've done pretty well. Yeah. So you learned all your plant biology from Winslow? Yes, that's right. Oh, none, none from anybody else. <laughs> well, <laughs> which brings me to the embarrassing remembrance of my oral exam. When you asked me to name three plant families and describe them. I did what? <laughs> That's exactly what I said. <laughs> I said, I said oh, well. yes, we will forget about that. But <laughs> can, can you do nonetheless, it? Nonetheless, can you do it now? No. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, nonetheless, I passed. Yeah. Yes, you did. Rather well, as I recall. <laughs> so. Well, 
we all have things that we're not we're not good at, but <laughs> ignorant, ignorant. That's right, that's all. right, right, right. So, no, so I, then, go yes. Ahead. No, I was going to say. So then, you moved on to the well. I moved back, I should say, to the blue light. Uh, well, I moved, uh, receptor. Yeah, I moved uh, back to the blue light receptor uh, when I first came out here to came back to Carnegie, Carnegie. and Stanford, mm -hmm. and went totally off the track. We looked at something we were sure was the blue light receptor, and we studied it and looked mm -hmm. at its biochemistry and so forth and so on. And after six or seven papers on it, uh, which were very well received, uh, we decided that it was a very interesting artifact. And <laughs> that was that. And went back to other things uh, until, well, <clears throat> one postdoc in another lab at Stanford, in a, a man by the name of Peter Ray, mm -hmm. had been doing some experiments uh, with oxen. And the experiments were of a sort where you dump oxen on tissue samples and then you make membrane preparations. Then you test to see what proteins can get phosphorylated. And his hope was that he would solve the problem of how oxen worked because you would find new proteins that became phosphorylated. And absolutely none of them did. There was no change uh, that was induced by oxen. But he took one batch of his seedlings that he'd grown in the dark, and he took them out into the light and let them sit there for a couple of hours. And then he made his stem sections mm -hmm. and the membrane preparations. And the sample from the dark had one protein that was really heavily, heavily phosphorylated. You know, must have had phosphate mm -hmm. sticking out every 10 amino acids. It was so black in the film. Mm -hmm. and the other one, in the light, it was gone. Well, it mm -hmm. turned out that Peter Ray was uh, interested in the auxin side of things, but didn't want to get involved with photoreceptor problems. So he sent uh, this postdoc, Sean Gallagher, over to my lab to see whether I might be interested. And uh, at that time, uh, one graduate student had just come, was in Peter's lab on a rotation, and came over to do a rotation with me. So I asked Peter whether it would be okay if I Mm -hmm. uh, let Tim Short, the graduate student, work on that project. Mm -hmm. And we rapidly found out that it was blue light, and then we did tons and tons of uh, biochemistry on it uh, without ever being able to isolate it and purify it. Uh, and that continued from, oh, from 1988 all the way to uh, 1996, 97. I think I remember you showing me that autorad when I visited the Carnegie. That could um, be. I mean, I, you could see I, it. From, you could I, see it from the end of the end of the hall. <laughs> you know, hold up this thing, and there was a black line on one of them, and it was missing on the other. And the explanation was very simple, and that is, when you turn the light on the plant, all the phosphates occupied their little serines, and mm -hmm. uh, then when you tried to put more on afterwards, they were already all occupied. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was that was the clue. Just finding it, and then well, then and then ultimately the ultimately genetics. molecular mm -hmm. biology, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. but uh, and then mm -hmm. in fact we couldn't, we didn't succeed in purifying using conventional biochemistry, it just didn't work, and then a, a postdoc came, Manny Liscom came, came to the lab, and insisted that the thing to do was to hunt for mutants, and so <laughs> he so I can't, over my dead body he brought a rabbit oxus into the lab yeah. this plant lab rat, and uh, we got our first mutants. And once we had the mutants, then it was only a matter of time before we ran down what the protein was. Mm -hmm. so, but it was long, long in coming. During the past few decades, I'm sure you've noticed um, a change in the way science has been done. Like mm -hmm. Today, we're asked to justify all of our work um, in terms of being sort of useful to society or having practical applications, whereas at least my guess is that when you started your career, you were able to pursue your science and your research out of curiosity. Um, did, yet, when you think about your most recent work on uh, uh, phototropins, mm. one would not have at that time anticipated that some of your discoveries would have implications with, um, with respect to uh, the function of pathogenic bacteria, for example. So, do you want to comment yeah, on the value of basic research uh, 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 in plant I, I, biology? I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a very strong <laughs> right. supporter of basic research. Uh, 
because I think that it'll take you in avenues that you just wouldn't get to if you were told to go after something or other. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I know that uh, you know, we, we discovered this molecule and discovered that it had this one little domain that uh, made a little cage that contained the flavin molecule, and that was what picked up the blue light and mm -hmm. made some wonderful conformational changes. But then these days, when every, every couple of weeks, uh, eight more bacterial genomes uh, <laughs> come out, <laughs> People started looking and they found, my gosh, here's that same 100 mm -hmm. amino acids, mm -hmm. sometimes as much as 50% identical in these bacterial proteins. And uh, from then on, it was fortuitous that we had connections with people who worked on a nasty pathogenic bacterium and that they were willing to do the experiment, uh, which was to test for bacterial virulence in the absence of that protein, mm -hmm. in the presence, in its presence but in the dark, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and show that. Uh, a, it was, it was necessary for the bacterium to, ver to be virulent, and B, that if you put it in the light, virulence went up tenfold. So I mean, this National Science Foundation was delighted. Yes. <laughs> because there's just this sort of thing they would like to argue justifies uh, supporting, supporting basic research. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely, yes. And I don't know that one would have gotten there. Uh, well, I guess one would have eventually. Somebody would have picked this up. Uh, but it was a weird twist mm -hmm. for things to... Uh, to move in. I mean, that's sort of the definition of discovery. You can't discover something that you already know. Yeah. So you can't target your discoveries by saying, well, we should study X so we can discover Y, yeah. because then it's not a discovery anymore. No, but I mean, right. now... So this is, yeah. N but now having, mm -hmm. uh, having picked that one right. up, we, we know, for example, that that same, same protein is found in other Mm -hmm. animal pathogenic, mm -hmm. pathogenic bacteria. We know that it's found in plant pathogens. Mm -hmm. We know that it's mm -hmm. found in the most primitive bacteria in the Dead Sea, for, him, for example. And what this opens up is a whole field of uh, molecular photobiology. What is, why do these bugs need a photoreceptor? With Listeria, is it the same story as it is with Brucella, uh, uh, which makes this nasty uh, brucellosis in cows and undulate fever in man? What about Listeria? Uh, that's a very, very poisonous, uh, nasty mm -hmm. bacterium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's got a photosensor in it. Does that photosensor kick up its virulence just the way it does in Brucella? And people ought to be doing these experiments. And yet nobody seems to pay much attention yet. Mm -hmm. I think I'd, I'd be able yeah. to, I can't handle pathogens because I'm not allowed to. But my goodness, uh, somebody ought to be following up on some of the other ones. A another experiment, uh, for example, with the, the brucellosis. Uh, there's an assay that you can, uh, for brucella virulence, that involves not just a, a cell uh, culture, mm -hmm. but involves uh, live mice. Uh -huh. And I'm dying to have that assay done with a mice kept in the dark or kept in the light mm -hmm. to see whether, in fact, uh, that helps them uh, in uh, the fight dark. It off or, right. Fight it mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, my hunch is that it will, and I'm having a very hard time getting, they keep saying, well, they're going to do the experiment, yeah, we'll do it, but, uh, but no, a year has gone by and it still hasn't been done. So if you know anybody It sounds like something we should <laughs> try. If they have an, <laughs> what are doing, I don't know how to handle mice. But well, we are <laughs> at a medical school. Yeah, but you can handle the stereo. Yeah, right? we can. <laughs> no, it'll get done. It'll, it'll get, get done, done. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that is a good example of the way in which absolutely basic research can suddenly take a weird turn that turns out to be quite valuable. There's something else that, uh, that the National Science Foundation likes a lot, and that's what they call outreach. Right. And uh, outreach, I always thought that meant that you were communicating your science to the public and uh, telling them what neat stuff you were doing and mm -hmm. uh, so forth. I see. Um, and. It turns out that just the very fact that I occasionally give a public lecture about uh, the after effects of a fire <laughs> to the members of the public is the kind of thing they have in mind. Mm -hmm. So any kind of scientific communication to the public that is clear and uh, if you can make it exciting, so much the better, apparently they, they regard very highly. So, that, mm -hmm. yeah. so when I think about the mm -hmm. photoreceptors in uh, mm -hmm. uh, these pathogenic bacteria where maybe a priori one might not have expected them mm. to have photoreceptors or for the photoreceptors to be important in their biology. Mm. Well, now in retrospect, 
one thinks that, well, after all, all the organisms on this planet mm -hmm. do depend on the sun. I mean, that is the one Eventually. sort of constant yeah. mm -hmm. uh, with respect to life on Earth. So in retrospect, one might imagine that photoreceptors are probably important to all forms of life, even though we may not have discovered some of them yet. So well, I'm sure, uh, yeah, I'm sure that uh, there are over 100 bacterial species mm -hmm. that we know have mm -hmm. a protein that has that domain. In the six that have been tested, in the six that have been tested, they've all been shown to do the photochemistry. And in three cases, they've been shown to have a physiological role. Uh, but that's all out of mm -hmm. something like 13 or 14 percent of all bacteria that have been sequenced have turned up with that domain in, in one or another of their mm -hmm. proteins. So that might almost suggest that there are still photoreceptors that are yet to be discovered. Oh, I think so. In the, yeah. in the bacteria that don't have this particular kind, for example, maybe they have something else. Well, an, another one in the mm -hmm. last five or six years, another one mm -hmm. which has a different mm -hmm. kind of a domain mm -hmm. has shown mm -hmm. up to be very common. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's still a, a lot to do. Uh, yeah. You mentioned briefly your work at the state park. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd, I'd like to hear more about that, how, how you managed to fit in, which seems to, to me to be kind of a major uh, project, in with all the other research that you're doing in the lab. Well, that's because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> simple answer. <laughs> Very simple. No, we had the, this park where we've been volunteering for so many years has, uh, it's 87,000 acres. And some careless neighbor back in September of, uh, 80, of 2007, on a nice hot September day, started burning paper plates in an outdoor 50 gallon drum mm -hmm. and it was rusted out at the bottom and the next thing uh, she knew the entire backside of uh, one of the ridges was on fire and it mm -hmm. wound up burning uh, mm -hmm. 46,000 acres. So that's half the park. It was really, it was half the park and it was, the fire was almost all in the park. And so I thought, gee, that, that would be uh, a wonderful opportunity to look at recovery, mm -hmm. vegetation recovery in mm -hmm. all of the different ecosystems. You know, there's chaparral, there's grassland, mm -hmm. there are hardwood forests, there are pine forests, uh, riparian areas along the streams. So I wrote a proposal to the park superintendent and said I wanted to train some volunteers and this is what we wanted to do. And he said, go to it. So I managed to collect about 20 volunteers, all of whom uh, had to go through radio training, all of whom had to uh, get training in backcountry driving, four-wheel drive, uh, and obviously get training from me. And then we had an anonymous, we had an anonymous donation of $22,000. Oh. And that was to be used to make sure that everybody had a proper camera, they had a GPS instrument. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what started it. Uh, what that means is that um, weekends tend to disappear because <laughs> it takes a while to go out and check all those plots, photograph them, identify the stuff mm -hmm. that's coming in and generally record. Mm -hmm. So you have two research labs, one at the Carnegie and then the other the, one, the one, of the, at the, one of them is uh, in the state park. Is about 40,000 acres in the state park. <laughs> but it's been it's been fascinating. Mm -hmm. so, for, I, for example, I learned that mm -hmm. there are you know, there's some species where the seeds won't germinate at all unless it's been a fire. Mm -hmm. And they respond to something in smoke. And that compound now has been isolated. We know what it is. Hmm. Uh, in fact, it's one of a family. You just burn, burn any kind of wood. Mm -hmm. You can burn filter paper because mm -hmm. it's a product of heating cellulose, pyrolysis product of I cellulose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a butanolide. Mm -hmm. You're the chemist, you'd know that. <laughs> and in any case, uh, it's, a, it's effective in inducing seed germination in parts per trillion. Mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't take much and it must be very stable. Because the fires in September, then the rains come and in the spring the right. seeds germinate. Uh, so it must still be around. Yes. And there are plants that aren't simply seen mm -hmm. except right after a fire. You know that uh, they're there because they mm -hmm. show up after a fire. Right. In this case, the last mm -hmm. fire that went through there was in 1961. Mm -hmm. So that's about 60 how many years, uh, 56 years, right. that they just sat there waiting mm -hmm. for this, some idiot yeah. to light a fire. But it makes sense because they have yeah. less competition. That's right. So that's the reason they... Yeah, and they showed up at the hundred, one species showed up at the hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. And of course they're gone now. There were hundreds of thousands the first year, mm -hmm. hundreds the second year, 
and essentially zero the third year. But their seeds are there waiting for seeds, the next seeds farm. Seeds are there waiting. Uh, well, in the meantime, we harvested a whole bunch. Uh-huh. So, well, uh, it, it's, it's worked out in a rather surprising way. One of the guys that's done some of the nicest work on the butanolide mm -hmm. um, wants to come. He's in Australia. Mm -hmm. He's been in the lab where they did all this chemistry. And he's been doing very nice studies on, uh, on plants. And he wants to come back to the States. He's an American citizen. And he wants to come back to the States so that uh, he can apply for jobs. He's in a postdoc now. And job candidates in Australia don't get offers from people in the States. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they can't afford to fly them back. So he wrote and said, I had talked with him, and he said, uh, gee, uh, would you have a space in your lab for me for, for a year? So I said, sure. <laughs> so now that uh, fire project is going to move into the lab. He's got some very, oh, nice, wonderful. very nice molecular that biology. And, he, and he's a really, he's a super able guy. So you can burn, the, say, a filter paper in the lab and get these seeds to germinate in the lab. Oh, yeah. You, what mm -hmm. you can do is you can build yourself a little fire in the lab. We take a filter paper and waft it back and a dry filter paper, waft mm -hmm. it back and forth mm -hmm. in, in the smoke, stick it down, moisten mm -hmm. it, put the seeds out, bingo, they germinate. Take another piece of filter paper, keep it away from the smoke, zero. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's very easy to do. And I have a colleague down at San Jose State in the mm -hmm. chemistry department, and mm -hmm. doggone if he hasn't synthesized some. He's in on this ah, project. Uh -huh. So we have a, have a good supply on hand. Well, that'll be nicer than lighting a fire in your lab. I'm Much sure nicer. That, uh, <laughs> Although, you know... Oh, that's right. You survived a fire in the lab. Oh. <laughs> you, know, you know, there's a very well-known chemical ecologist by the name of Ian Baldwin, uh, at a, at Max Planck in mm. Bayreuth. And mm -hmm. he's done a lot of experiments in, in the in the high desert in Nevada. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a species of t t tobacco, Nicotiana, mm -hmm. that apparently is a, a fire follower. It seeds germinate only after, after mm -hmm. a fire. And he discovered that you could go to the, your friendly uh, corner barbecue store and buy a little bottle of something called liquid smoke. Mm -hmm. And of course that is smoke that's been bubbled through uh, water. And uh, dilute it three, uh, one to 300 and it works perfectly. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about uh, having having ha having a, either burning down the lab or else getting some carrican from some source. You can do quite a lot with smoke. Uh, well, I'm sure with, the, with safe, smoke. the safety inspector probably appreciates that. But that's right. right. Okay. Oh, we published a paper on uh, when we first published a paper about the virulence in brucella. Um, the it came out and it got quite a bit of publicity because it was interesting that light would turn on virulence. So there. Are a whole bunch of news reports, including some that got to the Stanford Safety Office. Mm. And I got a frantic email from the Stanford <laughs> Safety Office saying, what are you doing with Brucella? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a license to work with this? <laughs> right. So I emailed back and uh, said, there, there, all we have is a little piece of DNA. <laughs> <laughs> and these bacteria are all safely known in Argentina, which is where <laughs> they were. So, yeah, so that's been, that's been a, uh, mm. in, an interesting project to develop out of just being in the park. I have a, a little bit of a digression here, but um, in reading your article, I noticed that, um, mm. uh, I guess out of modesty, you didn't mention any of the awards that you've won in your career. Well, and I just w wanted to ask you which of them uh, has been sort of the most important to you or um, Perhaps, or you can maybe tell us about the last one that's where a, you had an exciting trip that's, that's, to collect the award. <laughs> that's a little bit, little bit hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, the, probably the election of the National Academy uh, earlier on was mm -hmm. the exciting mm -hmm. one. And, you know, that was just wonderful, mm -hmm. and totally unexpected. Mm -hmm. And I had been exchanging practical jokes with a guy by the name of Hans Kendi. Mm -hmm. And I had actually pulled a fast one on him, he went to a postdoc in, or a sabbatical in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. I was in, in Freiburg, Germany at the time. Mm -hmm. So one of my colleagues called him up, mm -hmm. uh, Reiner Hertel, mm -hmm. and just handed me the phone. So I said, uh, hello, Professor, Professor Kendi? Uh, and they said, yeah, oh, yes. Uh, this is Mr. So-and-so from the Guggenheim Foundation. Why don't we have your report? Well, there were great splutters at the other end. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you both had Guggenheim fellowships for your sabbaticals? Well, I don't, yeah. can't remember whether it was mm -hmm. Guggenheim or something yeah. else that he mm -hmm. had. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, mm -hmm. about three months later, he, I got a call from the Frankfurt airport by somebody who wanted to know whether I had a, any knowledge of a person uh, who was bringing me anything. Well, this went on for a bit, and ultimately uh, he said, well, I have, we have in our custody a man named Cornelius Reed, which actually had done his degree with me, and he has three pounds of hashish that he said he's bringing to you. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and uh, there was this long silence, and they said, when? Mm -hmm. This is Hans. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. So, right. so, that, so that, gotcha. So, and about a month later, after that silly telephone call, mm -hmm. the phone rang, and I wasn't home, mm -hmm. but... Uh, one of our daughters answered the phone, and it was Stacy French, mm -hmm. who, who called up to tell me that I'd been elected mm -hmm. to the National Academy. Mm -hmm. So I got home from, from the lab in Freiburg, mm -hmm. and she came up and said, what's the National Academy? I said, well, <laughs> it's the National Academy of Sciences. She said, well, somebody that says he was Stacy French called up and said that you've been elected to the National Academy. And I thought, aha, Hans mm -hmm. Kendi strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that very vividly, and I, did, I had to wait for a couple of weeks before I got some kind of an official notice to realize that, in fact, it wasn't on Kendi. <laughs> now, the other one that was mm -hmm. exciting was mm -hmm. this last one, mm -hmm. the, Japan, mm -hmm. the Japan International mm -hmm. Prize mm -hmm. uh, in Biology, mm -hmm. and that came as a complete surprise, too. Uh, and that was quite, it was quite an event. Um, we were, we were flown over, Anne and I were flown over to Tokyo and put up in a wonderful hotel. And then it, the ceremony was presided over by the emperor mm -hmm. and uh, the empress. And we had, before the ceremony, we had a private audience with the prime minister, the recently deposed prime minister, <laughs> I might add. Mm -hmm. And we also had a, uh, a, a private audience with the emperor and the empress. And <clears throat> that was... You know, talk about being terrified. Yes, what does one say? <laughs> well, I had learned ahead of time that he was a biologist and interested in fish, and I had mm -hmm. also learned that she was very musical, mm -hmm. uh, apparently a very good pianist, and that he played the cello. Mm -hmm. So we had a little bit of conversation about that, and they both speak very good English. And mm -hmm. you know, so you know, the, instead of the bowing, mm -hmm. it was you know, mm -hmm. he, he put his hand out immediately mm -hmm. uh, to, to forestall what. Mm -hmm. <laughs> making the goof that President Obama did. <laughs> Remember, he, 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 he bowed right. at the emperor as the emperor's right. hand was out like this. Right. So that was, that was fascinating. And then the, the ceremony, of course, there had to be a lot of very formal bowing. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then afterwards, they had a reception. And the most exciting part of it for me was that all three of our daughters and their husbands uh -huh. were there. We, could, uh -huh. we managed to find funds to bring them over. So we were all lined up in a row for a reception line, and, and the emperor and the empress went right down the line. They talked with us for a while, and then they went down and they talked with each of the couples oh, for you know lovely. for five or ten minutes, how and lovely. it was really quite touching. That is. You know. mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so that was that was a pretty exciting occasion. Of course, it came with a big check too, but <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't hurt. Which right. doesn't hurt. Yeah. It helps to pay for the no, family was, to uh, go over. That probably, was definitely right. the. Uh, 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 a real high point, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. on the on the shoulders of many <laughs> over the mm -hmm. years. Of course, you'd probably been to Japan many times. Oh yeah, a before. lot of times, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Well, it, yeah, in the in the plant photoreceptor field, Japan is very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of excellent labs, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even though one of the, a couple of the senior people have had to retire, well, I mm -hmm. think the Masaki Faria, yeah. mm -hmm. there are still some absolutely terrific people. So it was nice to be able to address that. I had to give a, uh, an acceptance speech, and it was, I was told that it could be no more than exactly five minutes. I mean, things were programmed wow. to, the, to the nearest 30 seconds. Wow. It was really quite amazing. And so it was nice to be able to point out that uh, it was a real thrill for me to have this mm -hmm. field represented, mm -hmm. because Japan had such great strength in this field, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. met many of these colleagues were actually in the audience. Mm -hmm. so, uh, mm -hmm. so one could... Well, maybe they played a role in your selection in the sense, my I'm, understanding uh, is that the Japan Prize is given in different subjects yeah, every that's right. so often. The, su the subjects change. So this, yeah, so I mean, I'd, I'd gotten a nomination, excuse me, I got a nomination mm -hmm. form mm -hmm. uh, 
ages before, and it was to be in sensory biology. Mm -hmm. So I thought, yeah, well, neuro uh, neurophysiology, vision, uh, mm -hmm. smell, whatever, touch, mm -hmm. and, f and tossed it away. It was the last thing I expected that plant photoreceptors would be considered as sensory biology, mm -hmm. but apparently mm -hmm. somebody did. So, so that was exciting. Yeah, maybe plants are respected more in Japan than they are. Well, I don't know in they American are. science. <laughs> The Jap Japanese uh, certainly retire their professors uh, early, uh, at least yeah. the plant biology ones that I know. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. 62 out. Well, that is one of the uh, wonderful things here in the U.S. I mean, you still have an active lab, and um, you told me just a little while ago that <coughs> you still work in, you still work at the bench. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And <coughs> even even sometimes with carakins, some yeah. with, with these uh, yeah, wonderful smoke mm -hmm, compounds. Mm -hmm. So obviously yeah. you you enjoy that. Do yeah. You, yeah. So do you think that this is um, something that's important for a, a a career as a research scientist that one should enjoy working with one's hands or um, enjoy the bench? If you have a uh, small lab group, uh, mm -hmm. yes. But if you have a large lab, lab group, you won't have time. That's You're going to spend your entire time right. getting funding for all those guys in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but no, I've been very lucky because I, mm -hmm. after I retired, we had light-activated phosphorylation of this protein, but we didn't mm -hmm. have the protein and we didn't have the photoreceptor. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> then I had some surgery and I thought, well, this is the time to shut things down. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, one more try, and then, then uh, things broke. So we didn't actually get the photoreceptor mm -hmm. until four years after I had, had retired mm -hmm. as director. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that worked out. But not a lot of people can do that. That's right. It was quite a privilege to be able to it was stay a real on. Pri and real privilege to mm -hmm. be able to stay mm -hmm. on. And mm -hmm. <coughs> but as you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. grant funding, it uh, reminds me of what I um, mm -hmm. read in uh, the mm -hmm. prefatory chapter. Uh, you wrote that, um, that there were no advertisements in, for your first position. There were no advertisements in science, and it was a casual phone call from one professor to another that got you your first job at Stanford. And then you wrote about getting mm. your first NSF grant. But mm. the way it was written, it was sort of almost as, well, it's automatic. You get a job, and then you get your grant funded. Mm. Well, whereas, as you well know, today it's quite different. The typical it's dramatically different. <laughs> the typical <laughs> PhD it's student, a right, it's changed a little, mm -hmm. has to mm -hmm. do one relatively long postdoc, perhaps sometimes even two, yeah, maybe yeah. apply mm -hmm. for dozens of mm -hmm. jobs and then go through several interviews, uh, perhaps submit half a dozen grant proposals mm -hmm. before funding. So it's really dramatically different. On the other hand, uh, young people today start with a million dollars of setup funds, whereas you probably had nothing, or maybe one freezer or one incubator or something. Oh, so. <laughs> let, let me tell you about my lab at Stanford. Right. <laughs> 1955, there, right. was, there was no hot water in the lab. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, there was no piped in uh, distilled water or deionized water. And we had to walk miles down a hallway this way and then down another hallway mm -hmm. this way in, in the basement. To get the water. To get the water. Mm -hmm. And then lug these carboys back. You saw mm -hmm. some of that oh, yes. for just one, at least for, for mm -hmm. one year. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a very primitive lab, and they just had big tables. I mean, there weren't even reasonable lab benches. So if you had to do it again, would you rather be doing it in mm -hmm. today's climate with mm -hmm. the, uh, the stress of having to find the job, but on the other hand, the million dollars of startup, or were you happy doing it the way you did it? Well, it was much easier then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> yeah. No, the... the uh, the, the way I got that job is just outrageous. Uh, it really, uh, mm -hmm. it, as you say, no advertisement, uh, no mm -hmm. uh, um, equal opportunity, none of that stuff. It was just a professor at Stanford calling his old buddy at Harvard and saying, do you have anybody who's finishing up? I mean, it was as, as egregious as that. Mm -hmm. and, and then I went out, then I went out, and they had a faculty meeting that rotated behind me. So when I went for my exit mm -hmm. interview with the chairman, he offered me the job. So amazing. That, that is amazing. Well, right? it, isn't, um, it isn't the only time that happened, because another very well-known mm -hmm. Stanford mm -hmm. professor mm -hmm. was Paul Ehrlich. Mm -hmm. And Paul was flown out. He was at Kansas at the time, I think. Mm -hmm. was flown out. He gave a seminar, and uh, mm -hmm. his usual brash seminar was Paul leading Paul. And then he also spent the next day going around and talking to different faculty members. And apparently also, 
he described this recently. There was a rotating faculty meeting, and he got to the chairman's, uh, chairman's office, and the chairman said, well, Paul, we'd like to have you join us. Uh, uh, Amazing. Just like that. So mm -hmm. at least two that were done that way. Well, it's certainly nicer for us that it's done differently today, because perhaps we wouldn't have jobs today if it was still done that way. Right? Uh, that, that, I mean, it offered opportunities for people like us to have faculty that positions. Could, that right? could well be the case. I, mm -hmm. I remember um, we were considering graduate applications one mm -hmm. year. It would have been in the, in the mm -hmm. 60s. Uh, in the, yeah, it would have been sometime around 1968, 69. We had 16 candidates, and we had eight fellowships that we could award. Mm -hmm. So we had to decide which 16 of the 16 to take. And one faculty member got up and said, I, I, uh, I move that we accept this, the eight men. It was eight men and eight women. Had applied. I had applied. Right. I, mm -hmm. Because the, the women <laughs> will just get their degrees, and then they'll go off and get married and never be seen again. Mm -hmm. And they'll be lost to science, and we will have wasted our... There you are, Elaine. You are yeah. lost to science. <laughs> I, I, you know, fortunately, he didn't prevail, but it was appalling that that mentality uh, well, it's, I mean, still when existed. When I came, that was true in the biochemistry department. It's still true in the biochemistry department, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. You think even today? Oh, no, no, no. This was, a long, so. this was no, in no. 1966. I don't know about the present biochemistry department. <laughs> I would guess department. it wouldn't be that way today. But in, well, no, and if you mm -hmm. look at... Uh, the composition of the biology department at Stanford, um, mm -hmm. it's pretty evenly balanced, 50-50. I don't right. have a count, mm -hmm. but... Uh, the world's mm -hmm. definitely changed. The world, the world, is, has, the world changed. has world has definitely changed, and long overdue. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, well, Elaine mentioned to me that uh, mm -hmm. despite, the, at, at the time, the, mm -hmm. the, the policy of, uh, mm -hmm. of restricting uh, female students in the program, Elaine said she never once felt <coughs> different in your group. Uh, and she attributes that to you. Uh, to you. <laughs> well, it was, so. pretty, it was a pretty sassy bunch. <laughs> and she just was joining us. <laughs> Did you want to comment on how it was being a student in Winslow's lab? Well, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> He's sitting right here. That's yeah. <laughs> no, I think the wonderful thing about being a student in your lab was that you were really interested in the science. Mm -hmm. You weren't a politician, a science politician, as far as I could tell. God forbid. <laughs> well, thank goodness. <laughs> Which made mm -hmm. it a pleasure to work with you. Mm -hmm. And the fact that whatever I did, some of it was you know, my own ideas that weren't so clever, mm -hmm. but you took it seriously mm -hmm. and gave me the chance to, to figure out that it wasn't so clever mm -hmm. without saying, you stupid. <laughs> but I think the other thing was that you valued what I did in a way I could still remember I guess I was TAing in your course in plant physiology or whatever that you were teaching to the Harvard undergraduates. And as part of the course, you talked about my experiments. <laughs> and I still remember that. It's like, it was like a, a validation that, oh, yes, I was really a scientist. <laughs> it, that your experiments simple, were important enough for Winslow to, to, to tell his students about it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was something important to me that you never, because I was just a woman, let, let me feel like I was something less than your male students. And I always appreciated that. Well, I'm, gl that's, I'm glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, I think that's also reflected in uh, Winslow mm -hmm. telling us earlier about the student in his class who made the suggestion about an experiment. Mm -hmm. and, in, and Winslow didn't sort of poo-poo it or think, well, mm -hmm. it's an undergraduate yeah. suggesting. Yeah. An, yeah. He gave it... Um, consideration and actually then acted on it and uh, I think that's certainly an important uh, well, role of a mentor to encourage ideas in the in the students. Well that was a real piece of luck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 yes. to have this smart guy sitting in the back row. You know, it's one of those experiments you think, oh, why didn't I think of that? It's so simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. just simply take a little, little piece of glass and put it between yes. two pieces of tissue and see whether they still communicate or not. If they don't, then one answer. If they do, there's yeah. another right. answer. But it shows also your fascination with the science itself. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, the curiosity and yes. the design of the experiment. And, uh, yeah, but I mean, I think any, anybody who's a successful scientist has right. to have, right. mm -hmm. a, pretty strong, have a pretty strong element of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, but you have it more than many people I've uh, known. Well, I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm lucky. What, what advice would you um, give to a young person today um, who, I guess, is interested in research uh, with, with respect to, say, what uh, coursework preparation 
one should have or uh, what type of project to choose mm -hmm. or I mean what type of or, or any other type of career advice? What, what well, can you think of? certainly um, if you're going to mm -hmm. go into biology, mm -hmm. which I assume is what you're talking about. Right, right, right. You need to take mm -hmm. all of the basic uh, mm -hmm. chemistry, biochemistry, molecular biology, uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> and, and uh, you know, a suitable number of uh, specialty courses if you happen to be interested in animals or plants. Mm -hmm. um, I think more important, however, is what you do later. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'll do a thesis project, and let's say that's very successful and you get three papers out of it. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing to do is to go on a postdoc as you do these days, but go and do something entirely different. You, know, you can always come back, but do something entirely different. And then as you're doing your research, if you see something off over here that really seems to be uh, mm -hmm. something we ought to look at, even if your, your grant doesn't say that you can work on it, <laughs> you know, do just a little bit of probing over there and find a way to... I mean, that, that was one of the wonderful things about Carnegie. Mm -hmm. uh, once one got there, there were built-in funds that you could use for things like that, and we took advantage of them. Uh, mm -hmm. But be prepared to turn a corner that you don't expect to turn. Mm -hmm. And uh, you did that. Yes, it was... Rather spectacularly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well... But I think it was my, my ability to do that came from you, really. Well, thanks. So. <laughs> I doubt that's ton okay. entirely true. All right. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so you mentioned something that's special about the uh, mm. Carnegie, that is that you had uh, resources available to indulge your curiosity. So, and that's because, in, in a sense, the Carnegie invests in the people that's rather right. than in mm -hmm. a project. So it's not sort of a, a contract job where you have to study ABC. Mm. Rather, well, we're going to let you indulge your curiosity or and you maybe something will come out of it. Or you have to chase right. uh, funds where the funding is, uh, in right. the area where the funding is. That's right. No, Carnegie... Which unlike, is how it is today. Yeah, yeah unlike right. any university position that mm -hmm. I know, in a research university, Carnegie has enough of a budget so that each person gets uh, a position. Mm -hmm. In other words, I have money of my own for a postdoc. That's, that's what's going to support this guy that works on the... Mm -hmm. Smoke studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't possibly put him on my NSF grant. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the NSF wouldn't be very happy, mm -hmm. but I can do that. And then I have an additional pot of money for supplies. Mm -hmm. The department is really? well, well set up with equipment mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of, the, of the neatest kind, new confocal microscope, mm -hmm. with incredible resolution, all, all these things. And that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. That really means that you can mm -hmm. turn these corners. It would be more mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. More difficult for you than it was for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could turn the corner from phytochrome to blue light just like that and spend two years uh, with a graduate student working on the project and supporting it um, before we actually had a paper that would give us sufficient impact in the field that we might possibly get grant funds for it. And uh, you know, we, one sees that happening. Mm -hmm. one, one of our other colleagues, whom you know very well, wanted to begin looking at uh, cyanobacterial pigments mm -hmm. two and a half years before he could get a grant because he wasn't in that field. Right. And he would write wonderful proposals and they'd say, mm. the reviewers would say, he has had no experience in this field. Well, after two and a half years, he did. Mm -hmm. And he's mm -hmm. made a huge name for himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know. the Carnegie is a wonderful Car Carnegie, situation. Carnegie can do that. Most mm -hmm. universities can't. Yes. But even so, you ought to, you ought to be able to bootleg. No, I had, yeah. I had a grant from the National Science, excuse me, the National Science Foundation in 1957 to study mm -hmm. oxen in ferns. And that's when this guy got up and raised his hand in the back. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, wrote a letter to the National Science Foundation saying that this is a really interesting lead. Uh, has nothing to do with uh, mm -hmm. my original proposal, but would it be all right to work on this? And the National Science Foundation wrote back immediately and said, go for it. And I believe that's still true. If you stumble on something exciting, you can ask your program director, and uh, and they'll let you do it. And, uh, you know, I think mm -hmm. young investigators ought to know that. Mm -hmm. uh, that, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they, they thrive on it, and they like right. the NSF mm -hmm. really likes that. So. Nineteen fifty-seven. That was before I was born. So you've had funding oh, for stop more it. years. <laughs> no, but I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, you've had funding for more years than I've been alive. That seems. <laughs> Amazing. Early, so pli early, early Pleistocene. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, so you did some homework. 
Uh, well, I did read the chapter again. I had read it uh, last year when you... All right. Uh, remember, you had sent it to me before you submitted mm. it. Yeah, I was afraid and it then, might be too flip. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. I, I really enjoyed it. I liked the, the first sentence. Yeah. The, the man with the, the shotgun. With the it shotgun. sort of sounds like a novel, you know. <laughs> sort of, pulls you right sort of it pulls you right in. You go, well, yeah. I do want to read about the man with the shotgun and uh, <laughs> annual reviews of plant biology. <laughs> so I thought that was just a, a, a lovely uh, yes. opening sentence, you know. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I mean, as much as I know yeah. about you, I didn't really know about your Minnesota background. Well, the pictures, they're taken by a Briggs. Uh, who is... My father. That was your father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was a schoolmaster, and he got interested in. Uh, well, he always had so, had some interest in identifying plants and mm -hmm. uh, wildflowers mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So after he retired, he had he had a, had a Leica camera, and he decided mm -hmm. that he would get a huge collection of slides of uh, Minnesota wildflowers. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I used to go out with him, and uh, mm -hmm. that was one of those occasions. So these, yeah. So these were directly from one of those trips you took with your father. Yeah. What about Briggs Hall at Harvard? Is that related to you? Yeah, well, that's named after my grandfather. Mm. He was the uh, mm -hmm. he was the dean of the faculty at Harvard, and the first mm -hmm. president of Radcliffe at the oh, same time. Oh wow! So, so mm -hmm. Briggs Hall is named after him. Mm -hmm. And is that why you got all three degrees at Harvard? Because there was a family connection. Um, well. <laughs> When I was thinking about where I would mm -hmm. go to college, mm -hmm. uh, we had visited Princeton for some reason, and I raised the issue with my father, who was a Harvard graduate, as to whether I might be interested in taking a look at Princeton. Mm -hmm. He said, well, you know, you can go anywhere you want for college, but mm -hmm. I'll pay for it if you go to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that would do it. Uh, right. So that sort of mm -hmm. did it. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it seemed, well, it, as, it, mm -hmm. as I mentioned in that article, I was a music major until just the end. Mm -hmm. And then it was possible to continue in biology. You know. mm -hmm. Do you ever regret giving up the piano professionally? Well, yeah. I regret that I didn't have more talent. <laughs> well, I <laughs> think you, I've heard you play beautifully. Yeah, yeah but not uh, at a professional level. Oh. Very few people make it that, uh, mm -hmm. in that business. Mm -hmm. So there's more opportunities in science? Yeah, more opportunities in science. Well, no, my sister has made it uh, very well. Yeah, she's a very fine pianist. Mm -hmm. and, and she teaches? Um, yeah, she teaches. She teaches. And teaches and performs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's performed all over, well, all, pretty much all over New England. I see. Uh, with mm -hmm. chamber groups and uh, mm -hmm. recitals and things like that. Mm -hmm. How is it that you ended up, or your father ended up in Minnesota? Well, he was offered a headmastership at a, oh, okay. at a school in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So he took it. So one follows the job, just like yes. he just it, like he, he, took it in, he took it in 1918, and he reti had retired in 1946. And oh, that's not how, bad. That's how long he was the headmaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the school had six or eight students when he went there, <clears throat> and by the time he left, it had I think 300. Wow! So, you know, it was a private school. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, let me ask you about one other uh, thing with your name attached to it. With, uh, the Briggs Rule. The what? Briggs Rule. Oh, the Briggs Rule. Me? Yes. Can you tell us about Briggs That's, Rule? The Briggs Rule is very important for anybody right. who is on a faculty that has yes. committee meetings. <laughs> and while I, was at, <laughs> while I was at Harvard, I kept getting asked to be on this committee or that committee. <clears throat> so I finally decided the way to handle this is, yes, I'll serve on the committee, but I won't stay at any one meeting longer than 50 minutes. Because that's, you know, that's the academic hour. Mm -hmm. So at the end of 50 minutes, I'm going to say Briggs rule and get up and leave. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I stuck to it. And by gosh, the, you know, the meetings got more and more compact and more and more productive. And it, it really worked. Yeah. Um, maybe that's one of the secrets to your success, <laughs> is being able to no, not waste time, right? Yeah. Well, you and know that's why you can run two labs, one in... Uh, Look, both of you State know, Park and one in the, <laughs> one both, the Carnegie. Both of you know about how much time faculty meetings waste. Right, right. right. In fact, there, there was a long argument at Stanford one time about whether one of the curators should, in fact, attend a faculty meeting. And uh, this went on and on. <laughs> I wasn't up to the... I hadn't established the Briggs rule yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, finally, Charlie Yanofsky, who was one of the most distinguished members of that faculty, got up and said, I always thought it was a penalty to have to come to faculty meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than a privilege, yeah. right? 
<laughs> Needless to say, that ended the discussion. <laughs> so, oh. This might be a, a good place to, to break and thank Winslow for his time. Well, thank you both we very much look, for putting We up look with forward this. to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to write another prefatory. I'm not going to write any more reviews ever. <laughs>